Good evening and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 147, which reads as follows. Pasa citta katang bimbang arukayang semusitang aturang bahu sangkapang yasanati duang titi. Which means, Pasa, come and look, come and see. Citta katang bimbang, this painted body or painted image. This painted image, the body. Haruka yang, that is a mass of sores, mass of, of festering sores or wounds or, or sufferings. Samusitang. Samusitang, I think, should actually mean bloated, but compounded is the word, the common term. Maybe compounded is better. Aturang, diseased. Pahusangkapang, pahusangkapa, which means many thoughts with many intentions or purposes. It can be used for many purposes, is maybe what the idea is here. Yasanati duang titi. of which there is nothing that stays permanent, nothing that stays stable. A rather harsh announcement, denouncement of the body. It's the story told of Sirima, the death of Sirima. Sirima has quite a colorful story. She was a courtesan, which I guess means a prostitute or a, maybe similar to a geisha, geisha, geisha. Um, so people would pay money to spend the night with her, or they'd hire her for for whatever purpose. I think that's where the bahu sankapa comes from. A beautiful body can be used for many purposes. A power, you know, a healthy body, right? So she was bought. Uh, the backstory to this is she was bought by Uttara. Uttara was a sotapanna, I think. She was a disciple of the Buddha, and she really, really wanted to spend all of her time taking care of the Buddha and, and the monks and listening to the Buddha's teaching and. Uh, the problem was her husband was uh, was taking a lot of her time, um, requiring her to to uh, please him. Right? And because she was, you know, interested in the Dhamma, she wasn't really interested in sleeping with her or or in, in engaging in sensuality with her husband. She hired this courtesan for for her husband, beautiful Sari Sirima, and she was so beautiful that her husband didn't even complain. Uh, and so she would go about, Uttara, the, the other one, the wife, would go about uh, making all these preparations for the Buddha and spending all of her time making food for the monks and so on. And her husband spent all of his time with this prostitute, this uh, courtesan. Uh, until eventually the courtesan came to feel like she was the she had some 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 you know she started to feel some sort of ego uh, in regards to her situation like the husband preferred her to to her to his wife uh, and she started to cultivate this sense of jealousy towards the wife thinking you know I'm the one who takes care of him and so on and uh, so one day the the husband was watching Uttara, uh, I think her name was Uttara, watching her do all these, uh, prepare all this food for the monks, and he smiled and thought, he thought to himself, 
what a ridiculous woman. She spends all her time when she could be enjoying life. She she works really hard to to give food to these these beggars. And so he smiled, just just smiled at how silly it was. And Sirima saw him and thought he was smiling at his wife and said, I do all this for him and and, and still he's attracted to her. Well I'll I'll take her out of the picture and she went over into the kitchen where Uttara was was, prepared, was boiling or, or heating up some butter on the stove and she picked up this cauldron of hot butter and threw it at Sir, and, and poured this scalding hot butter onto Uttara. Uttara was, uh, of course, a practitioner of the Buddha's teaching and she saw, she turned and saw this butter coming at her and immediately she entered into a jhana of loving-kindness. She thought to her, she immediately had recognized this violence against her and thought to herself, wished a happiness and well-being for the for Sirima. And as a result of the incredible power of her mind, they say the butter uh, became completely cooled and it was as though a cool water was washing over her, or cool butter, I guess. And... Uh, so she, she wasn't hurt at all, and the servants who saw this happening, who were helping in the kitchen, immediately jumped on Sirima and started beating her. But Uttara pulled them off and said to Sirima, and, and, and picked Sirima off the floor and started tending to her wounds and asking her if she was okay. And Sirima became completely converted and, 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 and ashamed of what she had done and uh, asked forgiveness and Eventually, I think Uttara sent her off to ask forgiveness of the Buddha. Eventually, she became Buddhist. She became a Sotapanna. The story isn't actually about her. It's actually about a monk. So she became Buddhist and spent a lot of her time listening to the Buddhist teachings, practicing meditation, became a Sotapanna, and um, would often provide food for the monks and, and listen to their teachings as well. And uh, so the word got out, and this one monk heard about Sirima, and he went and asked these monks, you know, what, what, what is, what's the deal with this, uh, this Sirima? You know, he'd heard how incredible she was. And this monk said, oh, wow, the food, yes, the food she gives is wonderful. She's very good at and she gives the best and the most highest quality of food. But apart from that, she's also quite beautiful and pretty to look at. It's funny to hear monks having this conversation, but that's what the text says. And uh, immediately he was he was uh, he became attracted, and he thought he should go and see her. And so he he found his way to get into the the queue to go and and receive alms from this. Sirima in her in her great alms house, but the night before she got very sick, or the day before she got quite sick, and so she took off all of her makeup and jewels, and she lay down, and she had the servants prepare the food, and then, as the monks were sitting to receive the food, she came out. They carried her out on a on a palanquin or you know whatever it is those things that you you carry a stretcher, I guess. And she was able to, lying down, she was able to, to give food. And this monk saw her and he thought to himself, she's this beautiful when she's sick. Imagine how beautiful she would be when she's perfectly healthy. And he became completely enamored. And the text says this lust that, uh, this lust that he had accumulated during many millions of years arose within him. He became indifferent, was unable to take food, and he, he went back to his, his kuti and shut the door and didn't listen to anyone, didn't, didn't, didn't go out, and just laid you know, sick on his bed, sick with lust, sick with attraction to this woman. Now, as nature goes, uh, as things go, the nature took its course and Sirima passed away that, uh, that day, I believe, unbeknownst to this monk. 
And uh, because she was such a, a great lay disciple, she was actually the sister of Jivakai, it looks like, the, the Buddha's uh, physician. And so the king sent word to the Buddha that Sirima had died, and the Buddha sent word back that Sirima, he said, please tell the king not to bury Sir Sirima. Not to, uh, nor cremate, I guess they wouldn't bury, right? Burn, yes, right? Do not cremate her. Instead, put Sirima's body out in the charnel ground and, and set up a guard so that the crows and the jackals, so that, that the animals don't eat her. Um, and just leave the body there. And so the king had this done and he had a guard set up. And after two or three days, after four days, three, three days passed, and on the fourth day the body got all bloated, of course. And from the nine openings of her body, there oozed forth maggots, so they couldn't keep the flies away, and the maggots began to pour out, pour out of the nine openings of the body. And then the king caused a proclamation. The king understood what the Buddha was doing here. He didn't know about this special case of this monk, but he understood what the Buddha was doing in general, and so he uh, he called for all everyone to come and see Sirima. He said, everyone in the city besides those who are, are busy working or some on some official business, um, he called pr an, an order that everyone should come and see. If they don't, except for the watchmen, right, the police, everybody should be should go. If not, they would be fined eight pieces of gold. And then he sent the message to the Buddha that the Buddha should, that the monks should come and see Sirima as well. And that's how the proclamation went out. And it came to the, it came to the monks, and the monks started talking about how they were going to see Sirima. And this monk heard, and immediately thought to himself, "I'll get to see Sirima. I'll get to see this beautiful woman again." And he just had to, he uh, had to go and see her, or they they even came and, and asked him. They said, "Are you go? Will you go to see Sirima?" He said, "Of course, I'll go." And uh, they set out with the monks. Of course, when they got there, the situation was not as he expected, and the king and uh, the Buddha came up to Sirima and saw her lying there, and he said. He said, uh, King, who is this woman? And said, this is Sirima, Jivaka's sister. Is this Sirima? Yes, this is Sirima. But he said, well then, send a drum, send a drum, a guy with a drum to, this is how they have those proclamations, this is how they spread word in those times. And make a proclamation that we will give, we will give Sirima to anyone for 500 pieces, for a thousand pieces of gold for one night. Whoever wants her can have her for a thousand pieces of gold. Not a man said hem or hum, that's the English translation. I don't know what the Pali is. Nobody said anything. Nobody even cleared their throat for fear of being considered interested in taking up the offer. And he said, well, then ask for 500. And then 500, nobody said anything. 250, 200, 150, 25, 10, 5, and they reduced it to a penny, a half penny, a quarter of a penny, an eighth of a penny, and finally the Buddha said, tell her they can have it for have her for nothing, and no one said anything. The king said, Bhante, no one will take her even as a gift. And the teacher said, monks, do you see the value of a woman in the eyes of the multitude? The value of the female body, which is so well, so sexualized, right? And so highly esteemed for its sexual attraction. Such was her beauty who has now perished and gone. Evarupang namarupang kayavaya patang visrupayat subject to fading away, subject to loss. Pasata bhikkave aturangata bhavang. Come and see the 
corruption, you know, the disease, the affliction of, of the being, of the self, of the body. And then he told this verse, Pasajita Katang Bimbang and so on. So for us, um, obviously we're not practicing Marananusati or, or Kaya Gata Sati or, or the cemetery contemplations. But it's still a good reminder to us, you know, the, the idea of death. It's a good example of the misunderstanding that comes. This monk, I mean, there's many things in here. There's the monk's lust and his desire, which interestingly it mentions, which is a fairly rare sort of thing to say, that it's something that he'd had for countless lifetimes. But this is the truth, you know, a lot of our attachments, a lot of our habits are habitual not in this life, but over lifetimes, and so they can be quite strong. And so we, if we often wonder, you know, where did this come from? Why, why am I so atta attached or attracted to this or attracted to that? In fact, it's it's just a matter of cultivation, and we've cultivated it for so long. But the big thing here is this misunderstanding, this misconception about things, about, you know, why should the healthy body be any more attractive than the bloated body? It's only when we see the body bloated. There's nothing actually different from the bloated body with maggots coming out of it, right? Why isn't that beautiful? Why aren't we attracted to the bloated body with maggots coming out of nine holes? Why aren't we attracted to the smell of a bloated body? I remember once in Thailand there was a... I was sitting in my kuti and there was this terrible smell. Just a smell like nothing you'd ever smelled before. And then uh, I was meditating through it and first looked around the room, tried to find what died. And then suddenly maggots started falling from through the cracks in the ceiling. I guess some animal, maybe a, maybe a big rat or something, I don't know, died in the ceiling. And the maggots, like, all, I, all I know of it was that maggots started falling from the, through the ceiling. If you've never been around a dead body, it doesn't have the most attractive smell, but it's simply our, our conditioning. I mean, you could argue that there's something, the body is conditioned to react violently to certain smells, but certainly not certain sights. Well, maybe, maybe in the brain somehow, but we have senses of symmetry and so on, and when the body is bloated, it, it loses that, but that's very much conditioning, whether it's physical or mental. It all comes from the mind and our build-up of this life. And so it takes this shock, it took this shock for this monk to snap him out of that. Which is why watching the body, even healthy, you know, watching the body, watching when you walk, watching the stomach, you start to see, you start to lose this attraction, thinking originally that you were so handsome or so beautiful, and as you watch it, to start to see that the body is, you know, it's sagging and it's drooping and it's sweating and it's bleeding and it's infected and it's pouring out defiled and it's pouring out garbage constantly. I mean, of all things that we can be attached to, there are no diamonds and jewels inside. There's no sugar and spice. There's no. There's nothing inside that's attractive or should be attractive in any way, but. Now, the, the greatest point for us as meditators is to learn to become objective, not to be repulsed by the body. But through, our, through seeing how repulsed we get, it's kind of hypocritical. You know, there's no reason for us to be attracted to the body in one form. And this is a good example of how our misconceptions arise, not just about the body. We do the same with feelings. When we have happy feelings, why are we attra at attracted or attached to those? Why do painful feelings create such a violent uh, aversion in us? So it's a bold claim. It's not that we should try to deny our attractions or attachments. We shouldn't deny the, 
the lust and the desire. We should just come to see how wrong it is, how silly it is. You know, the bold claim means you don't have to have prejudge. You don't have to have any preconceptions. You just have to look and see. And as you look at the body watching you know, your own body, you start to see that there's nothing attractive or repulsive inherently about anything. It's us who become attracted or repulsed uh, through conditioning, often through you know, memories of, of uh, pleasure or pain. So, for example, if if you eat some sort of food and, and it's poisoned and you get you get food poisoning, often eating that food or even looking at it uh, will cause you great nausea or or, or, or aversion. I remember. Um, one time getting very, very, very drunk on peach schnapps and I could, I, I, after that, the, the, concept, the idea of peaches was just, the smell of peaches was just nauseating to me. Yeah. Well, sordid details of my past. But it's conditioning, and so we don't deny this. We don't try and deny our attractions and aversions. We try to learn about them, and that's the power of this, the wonder of it. This is perfectly uh, natural, uh, objective. There's nothing subjective or particular about the Buddha's teaching. It takes reality and it comes to see it as it is, boldly claiming that uh, when you look at reality, this is what you'll see. It's a bold claim because it's fully open to investigation. If you investigate and find out that the Buddha's teaching was all wrong, well, you know, that, that would be that. That is something you can do. There is no need for belief. There is no need to remain in a state of faith towards the Buddha's teaching. Once you look and see reality, you will have proof and evidence and, and perfect confidence in the Buddha's teaching based on your own understanding. So a little food for thought especially about the body, to make us all see how ridiculous we are with our attachments. Reminding us, this monk reminding us of ourselves. So there you go. That's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.